the way we are getting smarter as a civilization is by offloading our, our cognitive functions to the environment. So, for example, you can see the invention of writing as an externalization of memory. Mm -hmm. Clamar, let's talk about the noosphere. Uh, first of all, give me a definition. So the noosphere can be seen as a third stage of the development of our planet, which started with a, as a geosphere. So think about uh, rocks, water, air. Then life emerged on Earth and form, eventually formed a, a biosphere where life um, was able to, to be everywhere on Earth. And with um, humans, with communication networks, um, we are now forming a, a new layer of planet Earth, uh, uh, a, a kind of noosphere, which means uh, a sphere of thought. And, and so that's, uh, that's the etymology of the word that uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin um, proposed a hundred years ago. So that's, this is the definition in terms of spheres. Um, but there is also another definition, if we look closer to the papers of Teilhard Chardin, he sees the noosphere also uh, as, a, as a kind of planetary superorganism that is, that is forming. So, so in the sense that it's, it's becoming an organism that can um, distribute goods, that can distribute information. So it's, uh, it's more than just a, a sphere in, in many ways. Uh, so the concept of a, a planetary superorganism uh, is uh, it seems like a nice metaphor, um, but uh, to, to kind of uh, reify it and, and make it as something real, like uh, like how organelles work in a cell, and a cell is a uh, an a, an organ system that really works together in a real way. Uh, it seems like a a, a a step too far. Taylor would argue that that no, precisely in his uh, in his paper, uh, the formation of the noosphere um, from 1947, he says precisely that it goes beyond a, a metaphor, and um, and it's true that we can see almost uh, all processes that uh, all abstract functions that that living systems do, they are, they are getting implemented at a, at a planetary scale. Uh, of course, we don't have uh, reproduction, so, although you could maybe argue that uh, colonizing planet Mars would be a kind of reproduction mm -hmm. if we would terraform it. That's still something in progress. So in this sense, your critique holds that we, we don't have a fully functional super organism. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a great vision for, for the future and what, what should be done with planet Earth. I, I can't argue with that. I mean, that is, again, what I would say is a, is a very nice metaphor and helps us understand what we should do with Earth and how we should all work together. Um, and, and I think that's a, a real contribution, a real understanding. And I think we're moving in that direction. It's just that when we try to make it an actuality, that it is something real, uh, that, you know, I would hesitate. Yes, and I think there are also psychological obstacles to, to this idea. And, and uh, I mean, the concept of superorganism is often associated with um, uh, social insects. So uh, an ant colony is a kind of superorganism in biology. Um, and so if, if this would be true for planet Earth, it would mean that it might make us feel like insignificant nodes in a in a very big thing, but I think yes, there, there are limits to this analogy, and and, uh, and uh, the, the the planetary superorganism would be different from any other thing we've seen before. Um, just uh, for example, we are very different from social insects. Uh, the social insects they they all come from one single queen, so they have almost all the same genetic material, and that's how they can collaborate together. We humans are much more diverse, and and so the dynamics wouldn't be wouldn't be the the, the same, and and those fears are um, 
I don't think they are really justified. Uh, the core um, motivation for um, the noosphere is a is evolution and evolutionary development for sure, but it is a directional evolution. It, it, it is not the traditional contingent or accidental evolution that is in traditional evolutionary theory. And it, it seems to uh, recruit the um, what for long t periods of time was a dirty word, uh, teleology uh, in, uh, in evolutionary development. But, but that is indeed the case. The noosphere in its uh, core understanding is a directional evolution that is uh, founded on a teleological vision. Is that not right? Yes, it's true. In the in the mind of uh, Teilhard de Chardin, he had certainly a, a teleolo teleological view of of evolution, which has been refuted in the scientific theories that he was using, which is called orthogenesis. So it's the idea that uh, the evolutionary phyla um, uh, develop uh, in a in a predetermined way. I think uh, Taylor got the intuition right in, in the sense, like if we zoom out, if we look at the, the whole of cosmic evolution, we started with with the origin of life with very simple protocells or cells up to today our amazing uh, technological and global society. So there has been some complexification, some progress. Uh, progress is a value laden um, word, but some some kind of direction and the, the question is is um, foremost about the mechanisms so what are the mechanisms leading to that so Taylor was wrong with the mechanism but I think his intuition is 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 still correct and um, the reason why mainstream evolutionary biology um, is focused on this gene centric view was actually to to establish historically the evolutionary science as a as a serious scientific discipline so the the architect of the of the modern synthesis they they rejected all papers and all thinking about uh, macroevolution of and yeah. the grand trajectory which had benefits of establishing evolutionary science as a serious science but the the big uh, drawback is that we lost uh, the big picture mm. Yeah, I, I I have had my own little history with noosphere, not being an expert in it. My first sense when I first started looking at it is it seemed like, well, um, it seemed like the World's Fair of 1939. It was sort of a, a view of the future from a, a very, uh, 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 from, from a past perspective that that is, is a historical uh, anomaly or interesting historically, but has no real relevance. But, you know, as I began to speak to people, uh, I don't know if I'm easily um, converted, uh, but I began to see a little bit more in its um, in its predictive powers, potentially, but still keeping it in the realm of metaphor. And also from a purely scientific perspective, there is the issue that uh, Taylor was uh, a paleobiologist, but also um, a, a very religious and spiritual person. And, and so I think it makes uh, a lot of scientists reject uh, the, the noosphere idea for this very reason. Um, Good point. But uh, still, um, I think it's possible to to conceptualize uh, the no sphere without without this religious uh, background, and the proof of that is actually the the uh, Ukrainian Russian polymath Vladimir Vernatsky, who also developed uh, the the no sphere idea and and defended it, and he was completely materialist and atheist, and so he he st still used it um, very much. You, you've had some of your own developmental thinking um, based on the noosphere, but taking it further uh, in terms of uh, a, a distributing cognition, which, which you go from what you call local brains to the global brain and indeed to a cosmological connection of some kind. So walk me through that very briefly. 
Yes, yeah, so this is a paper that I wrote in 2015 and so it's um it's basically a, a vision of how the noosphere or global brain could become more and more intelligent and what I I identified is that the the way we are getting smarter as a civilization is by offloading our, our cognitive functions to the environment. So for example, you can see the invention of writing as an externalization of memory. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you don't need the oral tradition uh, only anymore. You can start writing books and, and diffuse messages through books. Another major breakthrough is uh, the invention of the computer suddenly you don't need to do all the, the calculations uh, in your head. You can offload uh, the capacity to, to compute to, to computers. And uh, I also give the example, I think, in the paper of, uh, of orientation, to be able to orient yourself in, the, in your environment. Nowadays, almost everybody uses uh, GPS and we don't know how to orient ourselves without it. So we've offloaded uh, these capabilities. And of course, since uh, two years, we have uh, artificial intelligence that, that is a massive uh, offloading of almost any human uh, cognitive capacity. So yeah, in the paper, I was not imagining that one single system could uh, offload um, so many human cognitive capacities. Uh, and so in this perspective, the AI revolution that we are living now might be 10 times more important than the invention of writing. I mean, it, it's, it's of this order of, of magnitude, I would say. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.